this was a backlash against all the change that a country has been through. The democratic machine needs to really look at who they are endorsing and who they are lining up behind in this moment. This is not really a question of messaging. If you want to be back the messaging that is that is apparently strong enough to kill your candidacy there's a very there's one easy way to do it deliver for working people it's all coming up malora fly the show the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it welcome What's it going to take to win elections in 2022 from the contest for governor in Virginia to school board races across the country opposing what its critics call critical race theory has for many candidates been an effective way to defeat Democrats at the polls this year. Does that justify the conclusions drawn by so many in the media that Democrats therefore need to stop talking so much about racism and history and face electoral reality and even white anxieties more soberly in the year ahead? Or is there a different way to report on the CRT story and the last elections? To consider all that and more, I am delighted to welcome Sarah Lomax-Reese and Mitra Kalita, directors, respectively, of WURD Radio in Philadelphia and Epicenter NYC in Queens, New York. They collectively, are the co-founders of URL Media, about which you'll hear more in a minute, and they've been hosting monthly Meet the BIPOC Press episodes right here, all year. Also with us, Maximilian Alvarez, editor-in-chief at The Real News Network in Baltimore, with whom we've also collaborated on a few episodes this year. With all that by way of introduction, welcome all three. I am very glad to have you with me. Thanks, Laura. It's great to be here with you again. And um, URL Media, it stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love. And it's a network of Black and Brown, high-performing Black and Brown-owned media outlets from across the country. Um, WURD, my outlet, and Epicenter, Mitra's outlet, are two of the nine media organizations that are currently a part of URL Media Network. And we come together to share content, to... um, increase our reach and to share revenues. And the real news, Max, just for people that haven't heard about it? Uh, We produce a a lot of different types of media, um, video-based reports, podcasts, text reports, and we're really dedicated to lifting up the lives, voices, and struggles of everyday people who are so often forgotten by or ignored by the mainstream media, which includes workers, which includes people who have been victimized by the prison industrial complex, and people fighting for a better world around the globe. All right. So, Mitra, coming to you. Epicenter NYC started as a community media operation, and yet here you are now in this network that you've co-founded with Sarah, and on the day or maybe a couple of days after the election, you write a newsletter in which you reflect on your perspectives on that November vote. Can you go back there to to what you were thinking and and what we were hearing from the members of your network, Mitra? Sure. So here in the epicenter on the Tuesday night of election day, we were making history. Our first South Asian city councilman is from here in Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. And so I was at a party on election night at a gay bar on Roosevelt Avenue in Jackson Heights, iconic strip that's one of the most diverse strips, not just in New York City, not just in in America, but in the world. And it's euphoric, right? Because of the new face of New York City government. And my phone wasn't really working. Like the reception wasn't great. And people, because you're at a campaign party are starting to buzz about Phil Murphy might not be winning in New Jersey. And I was like, what? You know, and so, I stepped outside as the journalist I am, and I said, what's happening in the rest of the country? And there could not be two starker contrasts between this feeling in New York of representation at last. And when I look on my phone, and of course I go to Twitter first, I confess, um, and it's just this feeling of what's happening. Hold that. Then, Sarah, what about you? You're in Philadelphia. Hit some wins and misses, you know, wins and losses there, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, same same feeling because obviously Philadelphia is right on the border of New Jersey. And so, you know, the, the idea that 
Nobody was really even paying attention to the New Jersey governor's race. It was like assumed that Phil Murphy would win. And I had been really paying attention to the Virginia um, governor's race because that was so concerning. It got tight, you know, right at the end. And the fact that they called it um, for the Republican, I was just, you know, I was, I was really floored. In, in Pennsylvania, you know, Philadelphia is a predominantly black city. It's very diverse. And it is the driver of the of the state, really, from from electoral politics. And but the middle of the state between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, it's they call it Pennsylvania. It's like Kentucky in the middle of the state. It's very red. And so if Philadelphia and Pittsburgh don't really show up and activate, the state oftentimes goes red. And so that's what we saw on uh, Election Day in, in early November is that um, you know uh, the Republicans had a big day and um, a lot of the, the, the themes that we're gonna talk about today in terms of critical race theory were, were very much present in the conversations that kind of flipped um, some of the, those, those uh, statewide elections to go in the favor of Republicans. Yeah, Max, uh, is any of this resonating for you? In the immediate wake of these elections and um, the kind of high profile loss in Virginia, in the Virginia race, immediately, right, this became a question of messaging for the Democratic establishment. It's like, how did we screw up our messaging? Oh, progressives are the ones to blame. People who talk about race are to blame. People who are trying to solve the systemic issues of over-policing and brutalization of Black, Brown, Indigenous communities, they're the problem because their message is, is, is alienating voters. When the thing that is kind of hilarious to me is that progressives and leftists alike are all, all saying like, look, this is not a real, really a question of messaging. If you want to beat back the messaging that is that is apparently strong enough to kill your candidacy, there's a very, there's one easy way to do it deliver for working people, actually improve people's lives, and then point to your record and say like, look, whatever the media wants to tell you about how bad we are, has your life gotten better under us? If you have, messaging is, that's the biggest, the best message that you can mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. send to voters. So not so much the messaging as the actual delivering of, of quality of life changes for voters? What a concept. Um, Sarah, <laughs> to you. I, I kind of disagree with Max that I think messaging is absolutely critical. And I think the Democrats, because they have so much more of a diverse constituency, they're not just, they can't just have one note around racism and white supremacy, which I think plays really well on the Republican side. They've got to be much more complex, nuanced, and, and really um, talk to a very um, diverse and, and complex array of people. And it's hard to just come up with one message that's going to hit home for all of them. Michelle Goldberg wrote an interesting op-ed in the New York Times where she said, you know, the quality of schooling is the issue, or meaning the, the, the condition of our public schools, the gaps in our public school systems are so great right now, economic, you know, pandemic related, um, and every other kind. If the Democrats and progressives don't shore up those schools, that gap is going to be something that right-wing ideologues can just drive a Mack truck through. Um, Mitra, coming to you on this, where do you stand on the it's messaging versus, you know, the reality we're living in needs to change? I mean, I think messaging is everything, but I think the demographics, both of voter turnout as well as the reality of this country, which is still majority white, necessitates some type of I don't know if it's Max's worker language or coalition building, but clearly a white vote has been alienated and there needs to be some way of inclusion that is not, because I'm looking at 2022 and the midterms and I'm just saying, look, just on the numbers game alone, ideologically, this can be a big tent, right? This can be a big tent. And I think many of us who looked at the vote from election day are saying, oh, geez, like, are my kids not going to learn, you know, Black authors? Are, are we not going to learn basic civil rights history? So meaning there's such a fundamental backlash yeah. 
that for some of us, it's just like, no, no, we just need to get back to like 1993 and like multi culty times. And so I, I wanna be clear that the backlash is not just sliding to kind of pre-Trump or this is like pretty fundamental. And then the other thing I would say on that schools, I think this was a backlash against all the change that a country has been through, which is profound, which definitely for a white population is not, you know, the norm. Um, you know, I, I could say as the child of immigrants, like upheaval, leaving a former life behind, like that's kind of par for the course for us, right? So COVID and the reinvention we've had to do in our communities is not that it's been easy, but it's perhaps a little bit more natural. I think there is absolutely a demographic in this country that is looking around at their kids' schools, which feels like the most stable. If you think about like what's been the constant between my life, my kids' life, and my parents' life, pretty much school that you'd like go in the morning, come back in the afternoon, that's the only thing. So just think about that upheaval. Um, I think people were voting against change. I don't think it was just critical race theory and the teaching of it in schools. I think it was in reaction to pronouns. I think it was in reaction to a climate of diversity in our workplaces. I think it was- um, It might've been in reaction to, to Terry McAuliffe saying parents don't play a role. It's like, wait a minute, we just spent an entire year homeschooling. Teaching our children, <laughs> exactly. I know that you and, and Mitra don't absolutely lockstep kind of agree on all this. Yeah, well, I think that, I think that historically, um, white people have, and, and particularly uh, the political class, has been very adept at dog whistles, racial dog whistles. And you know what we're seeing with critical race theory and and those kinds of things, they are they harken back to Willie Horton and you know the attacks on affirmative action and the welfare queens. You know all of these things that you know Re Ronald Reagan and and different people have. Have have trotted out to mobilize. I think um, a a white population that identifies around whiteness more than anything else, and I think that that is not new. I think that they just have a different acronym CRT right now to to get behind. Um, and I think that when you can communicate and and articulate um, and package something so that uh, kind of white suburban moms, it resonates with them. You know, you're gonna, you're, you're teaching my children in school that that their history is 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 negative and it's oppressive and um, they're bad people. Oh no no no, that's that's off the table. And I think that when you can tap into that demographic, because that's like the the swing. I think the swing demographic, and I think that that the the you know kind of the Republican masterminds have really been masterful in tapping into that vein. And it's real, it's, it's, I think it's, it's so um, untrue because what I think everyone who is uh, interested in equity wants taught is truth. Okay. Let's just, let's just tell the truth. So how do we tell the truth in the multifaceted way that you're talking about, um, Sarah, while holding the reality that Mitra, you know, points to, which is there's a lot of anxiety in what is still a majority population hanging on by their fingernails that is sort of premised on not making white people uncomfortable. Honestly, the true history of America is actually quite, um, quite barbaric. We white people should be disturbed. Max, what about how do you how do you think of even covering this story? The working class is an incredibly diverse class. It is the most diverse class because of, you know, institutional white supremacy and patriarchy and all that uh, good stuff, right? There, There is a reason that, you know, people at the bottom are, you know, not, <laughs> you know, like are, are that are that diverse and stuff. But the, the, the thing that, um, you know, I, I think we are trying to kind of cover and follow through on is we are trying to kind of hold people in power accountable to the promises that they have made to working people um, and also kind of highlight how power to change this system does not reside solely in the pockets of people in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. or billionaires 
on Wall Street, right? There are a lot of different ways that working people are actually trying to bring about the sort of changes that we want to see. There is an, an incredibly important election going on right now in the Teamsters to um, decide what the leadership is going to be now that the Hoffa era has officially ended. There is a referendum vote in the UAW, which has a very heterogeneous mix of workers that would allow workers and retirees to directly elect their leadership so that they can have more democratic control over an institution that has been corrupt and that has um, been investigated for corruption. And so I think one of the things we really try to do at uh, The Real News is, is do both of these things at the same time, right? One, really hold people in power to account, remind them of what of the promises they made and, and kind of uh, expose the shortcomings and the ways that they are going back on those promises. Uh, and, and then on the other side, to also empower people who are watching this to feel like they have a stake in making the change that they want to see and that we all have to fight for it and that we all should feel ourselves to be active participants in democracy. Well, that takes me back, Mitra, to your election night party, where there actually was a different story being told in that moment uh, and a story that your media prioritized in a way that maybe would have been good for the rest of us to pay more attention to. I do think that the candidates that there is excitement over are that combination of being able to talk about these real quality of life issues. And they happen to be candidates of color who are anchored in a sense of community. And I think there's a question over whether Terry McAuliffe and Phil Murphy are going to get you that enthusiasm in a way that, you know, the victories that you're talking about, Laura, you know, they don't look like those two candidates, right? right? And it does require some of these candidates and another very good mayoral, uh, incoming mayor in Cleveland. It requires people getting to know them. It requires media coverage that goes beyond the, the horse race, goes beyond the, the um, surface layer. I think that that's where this media question becomes such a core question to everything else we're dealing with in this country. Like you can dog whistle all you like against some your next door neighbor. I mean, somebody can dog whistle all, like, all, you, all they like against your next door neighbor. If you know that person, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna activate you to hate them through a message. But that getting to know your neighbor's part and the potential and the possibility is something media can either provide or really not provide. Um, Sarah, you had a victory in Philadelphia with Larry Krasner, important yeah, race. Yeah, Larry Krasner, the progressive district attorney. Um, he, you know, we we knew that he was going to win because he won the the primary. And but he is he's a change maker, and he is not loved by the FOP. He's, he's not loved by, um, you know, people outside of Philadelphia. But uh, Philadelphia, especially in the black community really see him as uh, a champion. And he's done incredible work around um, really looking at police misconduct um, in, in uh, you know, certain trials that were, were clearly unfair and overturning these, these sentences and letting people who were unfairly convicted out of jail. So, you know, he's, he's very well respected in, in many parts of Philadelphia. Um, but I, I do think that the, the Democratic machine needs to really look at who they are endorsing and who they are lining up behind in this moment, because both of them, I think, um, are, are kind of, um, I would just say, you know, they're, they're, they don't reflect the, the new vision, the new energy, the, the new um, experiences that younger and BIPOC people are, are looking for. And so I think that there's there's some some shifts that have to happen deep within the Democratic Party in terms of who they're they're um, getting behind in general. Well, well, why do I feel that we really need to have a conversation on our next episode about Kamala Harris? Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> but before we is, go there, where is Kamala Harris? Yeah. <laughs> before we go there, um, Max, you've done a lot of reporting from Wisconsin, where there was another story on the CRT front, a school board, each member, every single member of that school board having been targeted um, by the anti-CRT folks uh, for defeat, fought back, didn't run away from the issue, and won. Um, are you going to be reporting on that? Will you report on that? I want to hear more about how they did it. We want to know, too. And, uh, you know, I think there's something really instructive in a place like Milwaukee, where, again, like you take 
something like Act 10, right? You take, you know, the the, the kind of ways that people on the ground, um, people organizing like, um, um, I think it's Black Leaders Organizing Communities, uh, or Block is a really great organization that's been getting out the vote, that's been educating people. What you see in Milwaukee is, I think, a really robust sort of grassroots effort by people who want to connect with their neighbors, by um, school board members who do make themselves more available to that community and more accountable to that community um, in the way that you were mentioning, Laura. And I think that that is really significant where people feel in a lot of parts of Wisconsin like they've been abandoned by both yeah. national parties. And so they look to each other um, for that sort of support and to build the kind of power um, together that, that they're not going to wait for someone else to sort of build for them. And that's created some really exciting developments in um, places like Milwaukee. Well, I look forward to hearing that reporting, seeing that reporting, Max, and maybe we can do some of it together. I want to know. I want to know how they did it. Um, gosh, I really love talking with all of you and hearing from you. It's been a fantastic year for URL Media, and I want to thank Sarah and Mitra for your collaboration this year. I, I want to see it continue. What are you excited about as you look back over the first year, really, of this network, the URL Media Network, since its launch? And are there stories you have in the works for the new year that we should start getting excited about? Mitra. Um, for Epicenter, our big achievement this year was helping more than 7,000 New Yorkers and their cousins and family and friends all across the country get vaccinated. It would have been impossible without the URL Media Network, meaning when we put word out that we were doing this to TBN24, which is a Bangladeshi live stream, we would instantly get dozens of requests from Bangladeshi cab drivers and restaurant workers. When we put this out undocumented via WhatsApp, also one of our partners, we would instantly get um, similar requests for um, help navigating vaccines. So I'm really proud of that. Interestingly, we're in this moment where uh, families are trying to navigate boosters and um, getting their children vaccinated. It's also opened up a number of questions about the healthcare system that will continue to serve as a resource uh, because messaging on this indeed for public health is everything. So that's something I'm looking forward to for next year. And then I think the midterms, right? Despite where I was on election night, um, there were red victories in Eastern Queens and Southern Brooklyn across the state. Uh, the governor's race here in New York is something that we're uh, definitely watching. Uh, with close attention. And then nationally, you know, it's not a coincidence that our URL media network is seeing growth in states like Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. And you might say, oh, well, those are all swing states, but they're swing states because of black and brown people. Mm. And so we will be certainly keeping an eye on that. Red victories being Republican victories, not any other sort, just be clear. Correct. <laughs> Sarah, Correct. to you, uh, looking back on the year of URL Media, you've accomplished a lot. Yeah, so um, we have done so many things. This partnership has been amazing to uh, collaborate with the Laura Flanders Show on a monthly basis. That's been, been wonderful. But um, just having regular convenings, one of the things that we did that was really um, empowering for, for me and URL is on the WURD Founders Day in, in August, we all came together, all nine outlets came together, and we had a conversation about the network, about how we're covering our communities. And it was an amazing opportunity to see the diversity, the range, the, um, the different audiences that we're serving. And it was very validating and affirming to um, this concept that is under a year old of, of URL media. Um, I also feel like, you know, because we are independent media outlets and there's nine of us, the work that, that each of us is doing is, is really um, very life-changing and powerful. I know for WURD, a lot of the work that we did, similar to what Mitra talked about in terms of vaccine coverage and just vaccine education and, and trying to debunk the misinformation and disinformation that was rampant in the Black community. Also, um, you know, covering these different trials that that have uh, happened, you know, are, are in progress now, whether it's the, the Ahmad Arbery, the trial about Ahmad Arbery, or, um, you know, the, the Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, you know, that, that, uh, that trial, and just all of these kind of, um, these things that happened in 2020 that spark, sparked the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protest, are now working their way through the criminal justice system or the, 
the, um, the legal system. And so we're following those things very closely and engaging with our audiences to um, make sure we're in, in constant conversation so we know what's happening on the ground. Well, it's really been a, a joy to work with you too as well. And, and Max as well, we wanna have you come back, do more collaborating in 2022. Gosh, I can hardly believe it. We have another year ahead of huge challenges on every front, but an exciting one, I think for media, as we say here, you know, the commercial media's role is to deliver audiences to advertisers. And I really deeply believe that the independent media's role is to deliver people to each other and you help us do that. So thank you so much, all of you for participating in this month's Meet the BIPOC Press Media Roundtable. Thanks for letting me be here with you. I appreciate it. Have a great one, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm Laura Flanders.